you spent a lot of time, we're going to talk about some other folks now, you spent a lot of time with Chuck Brown and Soul Searchers, the go-go scene from D.C. Yeah. Um, for viewers that don't know, Chuck Brown, the Soul, um, Soul Searchers, yeah, were one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, band out of that scene. They had a huge hit. Um, don't know the exact year, I'm thinking around 1980, but Bust and Loose, huge hit. Right. So what role did you play, and what was it like being part of that scene? Well... The, the, the story goes like this. I was living in L.A. Um, and I had gone out there under the guise of you know, breaking into the circuit in Los Angeles and around. And it didn't pan out as well as I thought it would. Uh, it was more work than I thought. So Benny and Greg were like, man, we're playing in all these go-go bands. You need to come back here and, and, and play with us and, stick, and quit bullshitting out there in L.A. And I was like, deep down, I knew they were right. So I moved back, and I was playing with a couple of go-go bands. And we happened to be on a show with Chuck Brown. And Chuck came over and said, yeah, I like that horn section. Y'all the P-Funk boys, right? He said, yeah. He says, yeah. He says, yeah. He says, and he was talking about how he liked it. And he uttered a phrase that I remember to this day. He says, I'm the only one in town that's qualified to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> now, them there weren't fighting words, but that was a pretty tall statement. Now, I took him up on it, and I played with that band from 89 all the way up until he passed. And I'm still playing with that band, you know, schedule permitting to this day. And Chuck Brown, you know, what a lot of people don't realize, man, is that guy had jazz chops up the yin-yang. He was a fan of Charlie Christian. And I remember the first rehearsal I went to, I called myself getting there early because, you know, all this qualified to pay you stuff. I was like, well, let me be professional and, and honor this clock. But I didn't know the band liked to get there late. But he was sitting on top of his of Fender Twin Reverb just playing by himself and he was getting it i mean you know all that stuff you hear kenny burrell george benson west montgomery all of these guys he was playing all of that stuff so you know everybody knows it for check 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 <laughs> all of that stuff and people don't realize he's a beast of a guitar player as well as, you know, people called him Pops. And that name was well-earned because he was just like everybody's daddy in D.C. <laughs> and a very affable human being. You know, he would go to the store and get stuff, and it would take him like five hours because he would never refuse an autograph or a picture. And... And he was just a great musician and a, a great person. But on top of all of that, he was a, a real innovator to sit there and take that music as far as he did. Because what people don't realize is uh, D.C. is a very naturally percussive driven community. You know, back when they had the vans, van clubs. It was nothing for you to see somebody rolling down the street with the van door open, everybody sitting in the back with percussion in there, shaking or banging on something along whatever's on the radio. It's just what they did. You know, people would go to parties with tambourines, maracas, wood blocks, claves, and all of that stuff. And they would play along with the music along, as well as dancing with everybody. So percussion was very much something of... Uh, it was something that people in D.C. did. So he took that, added it to his band, and then the concept of the music going on and on and on instead of stopping and breaking, which prompted the name Go-Go, he, um, he was at the forefront of that. And anything that is Go-Go in D.C. or anywhere in this world, Chuck Brown is the epicenter of that. That's ground zero. I remember when, you know, it came on and you had Trouble Funk and EU and some of these other go-go bands too. And it was a scene. I was in California. Yeah. They talked about it, you know, maybe becoming like the next big thing, like it was going to, you know, um, 
succeed p-funk or something like that or be as big as hip-hop or rap but it really never kind of made it much out of dc except for bust and loose and the butt um thanks to the spike lee movie yeah. why, why do you think it didn't catch on more because in my opinion of course go go is more about being at the club, you, it, it's hard to record it. It's hard to to do a video on it. It's just the true essence of it is being there in person, and the the energy, the the, the cycle of the, the band feeding the audience, the audience feeding the band. You know, chance. You know, people calling out the neighborhoods and stuff, and and special shout outs to all of these people. It, the Go-Go was very personal. And unless you could take everybody in DC on the road with you, <laughs> it just wasn't something that people outside the Beltway understood or really got it. I mean, the closest thing to it was a lot of people in DC would go to college and they would take it with them and then they would introduce it to other people outside of the city. And it's like, okay, you know, go, go. That's a DC thing. But I just think that it you just couldn't really capture the true grit of the music outside of being at a go, go, which means that it wasn't going to really take off outside of it. I mean, there are other people that use go, go for a hit. You know what I mean? I mean, Kid and Play, Salt and Pepper, Grace Jones has Slave to the Rhythm. Um, and just various instances of, okay, I'm just going to use a bit of a go-go flavor, but go-go in and of itself was, I think, best played, best understood in DC and in, in DC only. I mean, only an, an aficionado outside of that would really get it, you know, because I've heard some bands from the Netherlands, for example, a band called Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You know, they couldn't be any further away from DC, but when they would lock into a pocket, it would make your hair stand up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just think that is, they never quite were able to capture the essence of it and, and make it nationwide. And I think that's too much to the, it's, it's a loss for the music community because even to this day, you know, I love playing go-go. <laughs> so we talked at the beginning, or at least I did, about some of the other bands and artists that you have worked with, and I'll just name them off again. Um, on that list, Sheila E., Gap Band, Stanley Clark, George Duke, uh, David Sanborn, um, Leonard Skinner, Kid Rock, Buddy Guy. List goes on. It's a huge variety. Um, you know, I don't think we can talk about all of them, but could you pick out, you know, a couple of them that you know particularly stand out to you, and what were, what was special about working with them, and and also if it was just you know live performance or you did any studio work? Um, most of that was um, was live performances. You know, once you kind of like gone a reputation then you become like a hired gun. You know, I need a horn section. I need a trombone player. I heard about this guy, Greg Boyer or whatever. It, it's, it's some of those situations where you just get called in because people are kind of like lacking. It wasn't like they're putting a band together and they want me to be in it. You know, like um, the, the Leonard Skinner buddy guy thing it just happened to be on a show called uh, the CMT Tribute to Hank, Hank Williams Jr. I was playing in the band then, and I had to, you know, write all of the horn charts and stuff because uh, the person that was originally asked to do it said, I don't write charts, so I'm going to pass this gig on to you. I was like, sure, no problem. And that's how that came about. And then the Stanley Clark and uh, George Duke and David Sanborn are playing on a Capitol Jazz Cruise with a house band in that situation. And I'm playing with these guys and and it's just, I guess, you know, playing, you know, these guys, they were all influences of mine as teenagers. And I was like, wait a minute, 
I have their records and now I'm playing with them. It was a whole lot of that going on. So, you know, I was glad to be able to musically contribute to some of those things. And like Eric Benet, for example, you know, one of the greatest singers I've ever heard or played with, but you know, he kind of flies under the radar. You know, we did, he came on the jazz cruise and just had it in his mind, whenever I come to your area, I want you to bring that horn section around you know, for my band. So, and of course the Sheila E thing is, you know, by way of playing with Prince and it's kind of like a no brainer there, but a lot of those situations were, you know, just a master reputation would to be somebody you can call in this situation. And that's a good thing too. You know, you feel like you're doing something right when people have all of these other choices and they call you instead. And I was like, I'm honored. <laughs> well, it allows you to get to experience so much, you know, different types of, uh, you know, musical environments and different types of players. And like you said, so many heroes from when you're younger. Yeah. And, and that's exactly it. You know, you, a lot of people are like, oh, the house band, the house band, but that playing in the house band in any situation, it just, you just open to so many different people, you know, had I not played in a house band, I would have never uh, done anything with Gladys Knight. I never would have been with uh, Erica Badu. I never would have been with Brian McKnight. Never would have been on the same stage as Anita Baker. Um, and the, the list goes on. I mean, it's, you get to play other people's music and in turn, they're listening like i really love the way that band is playing and we did the soul train awards one year and did a tribute to anita baker and that was one of the things she pointed out she's like that band and she's hard on a band anybody that's worked with her before I'll tell you that and she was just blown away with the the detail and the respect that we paid to her music. And, you know, that's, it, I guess one of the biggest accolades of being a musician or anything is having people recognize that you're doing something right. And, and that was one of those moments. So, you know, I get situations like that quite a bit, you know, just by, you know, reputation and, and showing up on time and wearing a shirt that ain't wrinkled. <laughs> You know, uh, Greg, I remember I saw Stanley Clark at, um, I think it was the Wiltern Theater or the Beverly Theater, one of those two, some years ago. And I was, uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, he's definitely one of my favorite bass players. But during the show, toward the end, he invited any bass players over there because, you know, it's the kind of show. He's the kind of player that all the bass heads go. Yeah. Uh, he invited them up on stage. And at one point, you know, there might have been 18 or 20 guys up there with basses. <laughs> the heroes, Dan Clark. That was so awesome, right? And uh, so I was wondering about, uh, you know, these other folks that you played with. Was there anything that stood out in particular besides Anita Baker? And also Stanley Clark in particular, being a bass monster that he is, how did he compare to some of the other great bass players you've played with? Well, he was... Um when he came on the scene, people weren't playing bass like that. <laughs> he he was an absolute monster, but you know, for all of his stuff that he's done on electric, his upright playing. Now, you know, the guy's from Philadelphia Conservatory, so he's got a lot of the classical approach to it, but his upright playing is just unparalleled. Is is he might have been that one of the first, if not the first, to put the bass out front. Well, in a jazz uh, respect anyway, you know, it's, it's like he was just out front of everything. So he, he was on full display, his playing, his writing, and he's just, you know, my top five at least, if not, you know, top three, the best I've ever done it. 
I got to see him again a few years ago with Chick Corea. I came back and they kind of got the return of forever thing back together. And it was at the, uh, um, that New York club, the famous jazz club in New York. Um, the, the blue note. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it was at the blue note. Yeah. So that was phenomenal to, to see that and see yeah. him doing that again. Well, you know, and that's a thing too, because it had return. They were selling out arenas back in the day. Had they formed that band now and took it on the road, I don't think they would get that kind of um, recognition, that kind of popularity. Was in, that's a, to me a sad state and where music is going. You know, it's it, it, they used to embrace diversity. Now it's all whatever is making a million. I want everybody to sound like that. And, you know, not having music in the schools as much as it was, you know, people can't tell a trombone from a violin, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And it was just a great time to be a musician and Return of Forever when they were out were one of those reasons why it was a great time to be a musician. You could just sit there and just play anything you want and the audience found you. You know, now you have to go looking for an audience is is somewhat depressing. I mean, I've I mean, at least once a month, I think to myself, maybe I'm in the wrong line of work because <laughs> I'm not that young. I I, I can't spit verses on it and, and that type of thing. But there's always a market for authenticity unfortunately now that market is shrinking but back when return forever was doing it i mean you know with r b funk or whatever it was like you're either p funk or you're the earth wind and fire you know that was the thing back then and from a jazz standpoint it was either you're either return forever or your weather report you know but that's that's how big they were so Meeting and playing with Stanley Clark, man, I was just like, ah. <laughs> and I managed to be a little bit cooler about it now that I've mellowed in, you know, my older age. But had I met him when I was in my twenties, my tongue would have been dragging the floor. <laughs> and deep down, that kid is still in me, so that's the way I felt when I met him. Wow. So, what about the different styles of music? You know, how how's it? How's it feel playing the rock or the blues versus the funk or the, you know, soul? Uh, is is one harder than the other? Are they just different. You know, do you prefer funk? Where do you fall on that spectrum? Well, I think it, it, a lot of people when they say one harder than the other, more difficult than the other, they base that answer a lot of times on technique. But you know. I can sit there and 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 tell you about some people probably not the most gifted on their instrument were not uh, you know on a level of say a, a, a Victor Wooten or a, a Jocko or Richard Bono or a Stanley Clark we mentioned before or anything like that but you go and look at an old Bob Marley clip and watch Aston Family Man Barrett play bass on that and tell me those little one or two notes he's playing don't have all of the feel that you could shake a stick at. So being able to duplicate that, the soul sometimes, the feel, you know, the heart of music is kind of hard to do when you're basing so much on technical ability or whatever. So going from one to the other, I say the one thing you don't want to lose sight of is what is the soul of what you're playing? And that is the thing I think can make or break you no matter what you play. If you can't grab onto the essence of what it is, then you're not going to be playing it at its best. And that could be, you know, playing jazz, you know, 300 quarter notes a minute. And the thing is like flying and you think, okay, I got to hold on to this tempo or whatever. Like the guy riding the back of a garbage truck. <laughs> you got to hold on to this tempo, but still you can sit there and play as fast as you want and be as technically proficient as you want. If you don't capture the soul of that, 
you're missing the whole thing. So I think, you know, the, the one thing that transfers, no matter what style you play, is you can't get to the heart of it. You ain't really playing it. And, and that's the hard part. You know, uh, I was a disc jockey for many years. I did a lot of uh, club work and I did mobile work. Yeah. And I had to play so many songs and so many tracks that I was not crazy about because I had to play to the crowd, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, as a, a player, especially you playing all those sessions and doing the house band stuff and, you know, there must have been times when you had to play stuff you weren't crazy about, you know, how would you get your mind right and get your soul into it when that would happen? Um, that's what I did. I had to separate how I felt from how those people feel, you know, and, and when I was the, the heart and soul I spoke up earlier is when you can look out there in the crowd and see that you have them, it might not be your favorite music to play, but you are doing something right to make them feel good about listening to you play. And that's just what you have to be mindful of. It's like, you're not just playing for yourself. You're playing for a bunch of other people. You know, the circuit, I uh, was mentioning before, the, the band feeding the crowd, the crowd feeding the band, or the, feeding the listener. Sometimes people don't want to get up and dance. You know, they don't want to just, you know, hop around or whatever. They just want to just listen to it. You can feel when those people are listening and they're getting what you're doing. And that cycle has to be complete. And doing stuff like, man, I don't feel like playing this. Or, man, this is easy. Well, I just don't really feel this. You are breaking that circuit. So you have to always be mindful. It's just like electricity, man. You know, you snip it in anywhere, the lights go out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, if I can say, if I can, uh, you know, offer any wisdom at all, that's one of those things that I want you to be mindful of as a musician. And even as a listener, you know, don't break that circuit. You know, one feeds off the other. Make sure you do what you have to to recognize it and keep it going. And I think it also is not just, you know, a particular song, but also even songs that you might like, but you play them so many times, night after night, for a long period of time. So I would think for even songs that you like, if they're kind of played out a little bit, yeah. right, you still have to do that for those two. You, you have to play those songs every night like you just heard it yesterday. <clears throat> you know, you can't sit there and think back. You can't say, man, I played this song a thousand times. It's no, I'm playing this song tonight. You don't think about how many times you've done it. Think about what you're doing right now. You know, or you're going to cut the lights out if you do that. <laughs> you can't let anything block you from being you know, from keeping the continuum. You can't you can't cut the circuit, man. You have to keep playing. I guess it probably helps if you think that there's bound to be somebody in that audience that has not heard it before, not experienced it before. It's going to be new to somebody. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, you know, you hear people say all the time, you know, like teachers, for example, they said, if I can get, get through to one person, one kid, one student, I've done my job. You know, you want to reach everybody, but the last thing you want to do is not reach anyone at all. So, you know, start with one. If you can reach one person, you've done it. So we talked a little bit about the current state of music, you know, which is what it is, right? Yeah. But um, still, you know, especially if you search for the internet, there's still a lot of talented guys coming up, a lot of gifted musicians. You see their clips on YouTube and all that. Yeah. What advice would you have for talented guys coming up now who want to make a career in music, who are, you know, facing the way the music business and scene is today? What advice would you give? Well, one of the things, the problems I have with myself is being a snob about the stuff that's out now. You, you can use what has happened and what you've seen musically before now as an influence, but don't totally write off the stuff that's out there now. There's, like you said, there are people out there doing it and doing it well. 
And um, and I guess more than anything, I'm afraid of not so much the musicians that keep coming along, but the audience, because you can raise a crop of musicians uh, from now and to the future, whatever, but without an audience to enjoy the music, what are they playing for? So I, I think that for anybody coming out now is like whatever you can do to establish a connection to and with the people that listen to or enjoy your music, do it. It, it can't ever be, it might not be my preference or it might not be your preference, but it can never be bad if you were playing and people were happy because once you see them enjoying it, you're going to enjoy playing. We talked about your ability to do the horn charts and, and that kind of thing. I wanted to ask Greg, you know, when you're talking about horn arrangements, what makes a good arrangement for a particular piece of music and how does doing horn arrangements differ from being the producer? Well, I think being a producer is being a horn arranger on a larger scale. It's just not just the horns, but <clears throat> excuse me, it's the product in its entirety. But the thing I try to do with horn arrangements is complement as much as I can. You know, I, I'm not, you know, it's just write the arrangement from the music out, you know, what would best accent or compliment everything else that's going on. And I don't want to say that in a sense of, you know, remember Granimals, you know, tags. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't want to say that it has to be perfectly in sync. I'm just saying add to that music. You know, if it's expanding the harmony a little more, do you want to do that? Or is something else going on? Or somebody singing, you don't want to write all, you know, a whole bunch of horn parts over the spots that they're trying to sing. You want to be as complimentary as possible. You know, sometimes it calls for long, pretty notes, chords or whatever. Sometimes it calls for uh, something percussive, something rhythmic. And sometimes you just want the horn section to just be along for the ride. You know, everything else is sort of like whatever. You might just want to add color. You know, harmony is sort of like different than what's in the, the rhythm section. You know, you go out a little bit, come back in or something like that. It you have to be very mindful of who and what the project is about because you don't want to just totally take over the you know with the horn section coming in just like ah oh, horns over here you know unless you know it calls for that but for my writing i try to be as complimentary as possible typically should horns be sort of the last thing that's figured out or does that matter um the way it's done now is that's usually what it is the horns are the last thing because you know we fill all of the gaps that are left over i think that, you know the, that's just from my experience what people do with the horn charts you know we're the the, the last to be added on because you know you have to write around you know what a vocalist is doing you have to write around what the rhythm section is doing you know very rare are those instances where they say put some horns on this and then they add stuff around that and they might have back in the day but they don't do that much anymore i think the hardest thing to me would seem to be especially with how much music's been made now would yeah. be to avoid having it come off as being uh, kind of cliche or cheesy sounding with the horns how do you avoid that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes cheesy or cliche is what makes the track work. You know, it, it might call for that. I mean, you can't have a cheeseburger without cheese. You can't have pizza without cheese. Sometimes you gotta have it. <laughs> and, and, and in those instances, you know, my question is what? Sharp mozzarella, provolone, Jack, what do you want? But I, it's, whatever it takes to make the track happen. And, you know, like I said, sometimes it's, you know, you got to be, you know, tie the yellow ribbon around the old oak tree kind of horns or something. <laughs> but it, if it works, that's what you do. 
I mean, you know, for your own personal projects, you might not want to do that. But when you're hired by somebody and they say, I want horns, you kind of like have to honor that check that they're going to cut you. So if that's what they want, that's what they get. Well, getting close to wrapping it up, but I want to ask you, Greg, what, what have you found throughout your career and even currently, you know, most fulfilling specifically about music and a career in music? I say, and I've been saying this a while, that, you know, I say something, something's got the funk. <laughs> You know, I say it's such and such piano player, you know, they got the funk and people, you know, think of the funk as, you know, the groove, right? Anything that internally makes you want to move your head or shake your ass <laughs> to me is the funk. And, and it doesn't always have to be music. You know, it could just be life itself. And I think that being able to find the funk in everything you do is probably most fulfilling to me. I think, you know, fun is a big part of that word for a reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is funny, but there's no, I think I, I touched on this already, but there's no, you can't define it because there's, like, if you could, there would be a funk category at the Grammys. <laughs> And there isn't because you can't define it. You just feel it. It's like it's like God. You can't define it. You feel it. It's there, you know, for those that believe. But you know, and for me, God is my funk. <laughs> yeah, right with you. I mean, I, funk to me has always been very spiritual, and yeah, you know, it's like all encompassing in terms of how you feel it. Absolutely. You, know, you, is, you can't explain why you move a certain way when you hear some music. It's, it overtakes you. And, and I feel the same way uh, about God. It's like you can't sit there and say, you know, go to church and somebody is just belting a hymn out. You can't explain why you just crying all of a sudden <laughs> you can't it's just you're being taken over by a spirit mm -hmm. and that's yeah god is my funk <laughs> there was that song god made me funky right was that yeah. the headhunters that was who was that i thought it was the headhunters herbie hancock's been well, i was thinking donald bird it might, i think it was headhunters yeah 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 so uh, before we, uh, we we wrap things up, you know, remind viewers again of your current activities, what you're doing, anything else you'd like to promote. How can they keep up with Mr. Greg Boyer? Yeah, well, I, I think I need to ask around to find out what this formula is for getting a project out there because I'm old school. I just think you just pay a bunch of people and tell them to play this, and that's what happens. But you know. Economically, ain't gonna happen because <laughs> you know the people you want to play on your stuff generally are a little bit more expensive. So I'm gonna you know break code on this solo project at some point. I've got the stuff written. I just have to find the people to play it and, and you know maybe figure out how to, to. That might be what I need in my near future. I'm gonna get a business manager <laughs> to break code on that aspect of it. But for right now. I'm still playing uh, with Maceo Parker, doing tours here and there. Uh, Newport Jazz Festival's coming up soon. End up in Rhode Island and, you know, just go to his website and I'll pretty much be doing that. And then I'm doing all kinds of other stuff in between. You know, I'm not being idle, you know, just, you know, I have phone ring. Greg play this or the phone will ring. Greg, can you write these horns out? And I'm still doing stuff musically. so. But I'll make it a point to put that on my Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and of course my web page. Anything jumps off like that, you know, gregboyer.net for all those that are looking. Um, yeah, um, you know, as my, my wife and I discussed this, you know, you know, when are you going to retire? I said, I'm a musician, I don't retire, I die. 
like cowboys, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah excellent well you know anything that's coming up you know sure and we'll definitely get it out there through uh funkinstuff.net so yeah absolutely um well so it is time to wrap up this edition of truth and rhythm a huge thanks to my special guest two-time guest greg boyer a true giant of the trombone and as a funketeer so thank you so much again for sharing your time and your experiences it's uh a gas to, to talk to you and uh, really appreciate it. As well. <laughs> Sincere thank you to viewers and listeners. Be sure to be on the lookout for other Truth and Rhythm episodes. Catch up with previous installments in funkinstuff.net and on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading podcast providers for the audio uh, version of the show. If you're an artist or music industry figure interested in being a guest on the program or a fan wanting to see a particular person interviewed, Send me an email at scottg at funkinstuff.net, and we'll try to make it happen. So until next time, on behalf of Greg Boyer, this is Scott Dr. DX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one. Because no matter how far you go, you always come back to the one, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>